as the century unfolded, the understanding of what this re-empowering of archaic values might mean has changed. Jung and Freud discovered the unconscious, discovered that we are not all ladies and gentlemen, but that there is a cannibal lurking within. Um, Albert Hoffman's discovery of LSD demonstrated that that inner wilderness is accessible to most people through chemistry. Well, then still later, it was understood that the, the key ingredient in active shamanism is psychedelic plants, psychedelic experiences. And in a way, that closed the loop between archa the impulse toward the archaic and the impulses of, uh, of modern science and modern medicine. Uh, the key is the psychedelic experience. That's what makes the shaman a shaman. That's what made the archaic in fact archaic and so people like Freud and Jung and the surrealists and the Dadaists and the abstract expressionists all of these people were very close to the mark the shaman is the paradigmatic figure and the psychedelic experience seems to be the anticipatory experience of, of this eschaton that we're headed toward. You know, when psychedelics were first being discussed, it was thought that they would prepare people for death. In a sense, they probably do. But in the same way that they prepare people for death, they prepare people for transformation. It gets you used to the idea that the world is not what it appears to be. And it gets you used to the idea that the world is somehow animate, intelligent, and proceeding along its own agenda. So in a way, shamans have always been anticipations of some future state of mankind. They're the masters of language. They are the ones who are telepathic with the animals. They are the ones who can see into the future. So this archaic nostalgia gets real focus once you realize that it is the shaman and his or her shamanic techniques that confers on them uh, the extra historical dimension, that that is how you get out of linear history. That's how you visit the realm of the ancestors. That's how you travel into the future. That's how you break up the tyranny of Newtonian serial time. Um, we have 14 years until this event uh, measured on the calendar. And, uh, you know, a really common, ordinary way to describe the times that we're living in is that they're very, very chaotic. Um, filled with acts of unspeakable evil um, and at the same time there's this sort of buzz and thrust of optimism everything from a guy like Peter Schwartz talking about the long wave the big booming economy um, breakthroughs in, in uh, you know educational levels and qualities of life but it's definitely uh, a dynamic where you've got extremes of good and evil in that way. Would you talk a little bit about the relationship between that dynamic as we go forward and the novelty continues to climax? Well, novelty is not necessarily good or nice. Novelty is complex. That's what it is. And so I see really a concatenation of uh, tendencies and uh, forces here at the end. It's only going to get weirder. The level of contradiction is going to rise excruciatingly, even beyond the excruciating present levels of contradiction. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, I think it's just going to get weirder and weirder and weirder, and finally it's going to be so weird that people are going to have to talk about how weird it is. And at that point, novelty theory can come out of the woods uh, because eventually people are going to say, what the hell is going on? It's just too nuts. 
It's not enough to say it's nuts. You have to explain why it's so nuts. So between now and uh, 2012, the next 14 years, I look for the invention of artificial life, the cloning of human beings, uh, possible contact with extraterrestrials, possible human immortality, and at the same time, appalling acts of brutality, genocide, race-baiting, uh, homophobia, famine, starvation, because uh, the systems which are in place to keep the world sane are in utterly inadequate to the forces that have been unleashed. Uh, the collapse of the socialist world, the rise of the internet, these are changes so immense nobody could imagine them ever happening. And now that they have happened, nobody even bothers to mention what a big deal it is. Uh, the fact that there is no such thing as the Soviet Union, people never talk about it anymore. But when I was a kid, the, the notion that that would ever change was beyond conceiving. Uh, so the good news is that as primates, we're incredibly adaptable to change. Put us in a desert, we survive. Put us in the jungle, we survive. Under Hitler, we survive. Under Nixon, we survive. We can put up with about anything, and it's a good thing because we're going to be tested to the limits. Uh, uh, the breakdown of anything, and this is why the right wing is so alarmed, because what they see going on is the breakdown of all tradition all order, all sanctioned norms of behavior. And they're quite right that it's happening, but they're quite wrong to conclude that it should be resisted or is somehow evil. Uh, the mushroom said to me once, it said, this is what it's like when a species prepares to depart for the stars. You don't depart for the stars under calm and orderly conditions. It's a fire in a madhouse. And that's what we have, the fire in the madhouse at the end of time. This is what it's like when a species prepares to move on to the next dimension. The entire destiny of all life on the planet is tied up in this. We are not acting for ourselves or from ourselves. We are, we happen to be the point species on a transformation that will affect every living organism on this planet at its conclusion. Pause for a second. Um, I see how, with, with uh, um, Jenkins calling it galactic cosmology, it's like our home continues to expand. We've gone from the village to the nation state to the planet. Now we're ready to take on the big picture. So let's just talk about the, the, the conclusions of the archaic mind, what it reaches. Well, the great watershed difference between the archaic understanding and what is called scientific materialism is the archaic mind understood, in fact perceived, that nature is conscious. Nature is alive. Nature is an organism full of intent. Uh, the goal of the archaic mind is to connect with, communicate with, and align itself to this greater Gaian holism, which is sometimes called nature, the great spirit, the realm of the ancestors. But this is what the archaic uh, mind understood and was comfortable with. And in fact, it is true. Our own uh, decision to view the universe as dead, as inanimate as unintelligent allowed us permitted us to dissect it use it and uh, and uh, deny its validity outside of human purpose now the consequences of living like that is coming back to haunt us you know we have almost destroyed our home we have almost cut the earth from beneath our own feet. So this impulse toward the Gylanic and the, and the archaic is uh, a survival instinct at this point. We must give uh, reverence and credence to nature and nature's methods because no other methods will allow us to work our way out 
of the present mess we're in. Uh, high temperature, high energy resource extraction, commodification, uh, mega agriculture, we're at the end of the rope for these things. So the archaic holds answers, but it only holds answers if we are willing to think of the universe as a living, intelligent entity in with which we are in partnership, not set against, but that in fact we are a part of uh, a morphogenetic intent and an unfolding reality that is larger than human understanding. Imagine, larger than human understanding. <laughs> so the whole entire Milky Way galaxy is a being? Well, it's a kind of, it's an organism, yes. And uh, the, the, the galaxy is a kind of an organism. You can think of it as a fractal resonance with a cell. The galaxy has a nucleus of very dense material where very mysterious processes are going on. Then it has a cytoplasmic envelope of stars and gas clouds that surround that core. And then it is an individual, very distinctly defined by the vast emptiness that lies between it and the next galaxy. Yes, I think nature builds by fractal intent and that uh, all organisms have a core and then a deployed surround, whether we're talking about the cell, the solar system, the earth, the galaxy. Uh, in the process of the conservation of novelty, uh, structures are created with cores that are more complex than their outlying neighborhoods. To my mind, a galaxy hanging in space is a picture of the time wave. Every star is a data point in an enormous computer simulation of the novelty wave. That's why it has that spiral structure. You know, scientists are very puzzled that the galaxies don't fly apart. They don't seem to have enough mass that their gravitation should hold them together. And there's been a lot of talk about dark matter or some missing factor. Well, the missing factor is novelty. The galaxy stays together because the galaxy wants to be a galaxy. In other words, it, it wants to hold on to the level of novel... Uh, morphology that it has achieved. It has an actual appetite for expressing itself in that form. That's why the galaxies are spirals. And in a sense, those spirals are very large pictures of the time wave where we can at last see it not confused with its uh, background or foreground. So everything organizes itself fractally, spirally with a dense center in its spatial domain and a dense center in its temporal domain. We are like this. Galaxies are like this. Planets, stars, bird flocks, coral reefs. Uh, but in the case of the galaxy, it's particularly easy to observe the structure because the thing is so huge that its forces dominate and damp out other forces which might distort it. 